Hello, and welcome to part two of our lecture series on the endocrine system. And in part two, we're going to focus in on the actions and activities associated with the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, or uh, the Latin name hypothesis, uh, was once called the master gland. And the reason for that is that uh, the pituitary gland has the ability to control many of the other uh, hormone secreting cells and hormone secreting glands within the body. Now, as we have a better understanding for how the pituitary works and how it uh, essentially responds to a variety of stimuli uh, within the body, it's seen as a connection between the nervous system and the pituitary gland is essentially uh, a structure that's located immediately below the hypothalamus of the brain. Uh, but the pituitary is seen as a connection between the nervous system and the endocrine systems within the body. We take a look at the pituitary gland, there's going to be two distinct structures or two distinct regions associated with it. We're going to have the adenohypothesis, and the adenohypothesis is the anterior pituitary. And the anterior pituitary is going to be composed of the pars distalis, which is labeled PD on the slide, uh, the pars tuberalis, and the pars intermedia, uh, P, uh, PI on the slide. And that has a very different staining appearance. The adenohypothesis, the anterior uh, pituitary, has kind of a dark staining appearance and a distinct cellular appearance that's very different from the neural hypothesis. The neural hypothesis is the posterior pituitary. And so if we take a look at the, the image on the right-hand side of the slide, the posterior pituitary is that paler staining region uh, labeled with I for the infundibulum, uh, for the kind of stalk coming down from the hypothalamus, as well as the pars nervosa, the PN, uh, on this the diagram uh, to the right-hand side. So again, the anterior and the posterior pituitary have very different appearances in histological uh, examination. And it's also now known that they have very different kind of developmental processes. Uh, the uh, posterior pituitary is going to develop from a nervous uh, tissue downgrowth where the anterior pituitary is more of an epithelial uh, derivation, like we've talked about previously with uh, hormone secreting cells. We're going to focus first on the adenal hypothesis, the anterior pituitary cells. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that we're looking at cells that are not directly innervated by cells from the nervous system. And so we don't have uh, an innervation coming from the hypothalamus into the anterior pituitary. We take a look at it, we're going to have two, I'm mean, sorry, we're going to have three distinct types of cells. Uh, the first are going to be chromophobes. Chromo, I think about this color, so chromophobes are color-fearing cells, or essentially pale cells. And then we're going to have two categories of chromophils. We're going to have acidophilic chromophils and basophilic chromophils. Chromo, again, for color, fill, for like or love. Uh, chromophils like color, and they're going to either like the acidophilic, uh, the pink staining appearance, or the chromophils are going to be basophilic, they're going to like the uh, darker basophilic staining appearance uh, that we've seen previously. We take a look at the chromophobes. Again, they're going to be cells that are staining very poorly, often appearing clear or white in section. And so you can take a look at them. They have a very different appearance as a pale cell in relationship to the pinkish cells in the image to the right-hand side. Now, without... Uh, Specific stains, it's going to be difficult to determine exactly what these cells are in a hematoxin and eosin stain specimen. But generally, they're going to be undifferentiated, non-secretory cells, or follicular cells. And the follicular cells are going to be the predominant chromophobe type. And they're going to be a stellate cell that's going to form the stroma or the supporting meshwork within this region. Uh, some books often describe them, or also describe them, as partly degranulated chromophils. But I think generally, if you see a pale cell uh, in the anterior pituitary, you see one of these chromophobes, you should think about this as being one of these follicular cells, the supportive cells within this area. The acidophilic chromophils, if we take a look at them, these are going to be smaller cells in relationship to their uh, basophilic chromophil counterparts, uh, but they're going to stain very intensely, uh, as we'd expect for a cell that's involved with the secreting product. Pro secreting product. Well, they're going to have abundant cytoplasmic secretory granules, and if we look at it in electron microscopy, the granules are going to be larger and more numerous than we're going to see in the base of the chromophils. But basically, you're going to be able to look at the uh, anterior pituitary and see these cells as kind of the pinkish cells, uh, the eosinophilic cells uh, that we would uh, recognize in a hematoxin eosin stain specimen. 
Now, these cytophilic chromophiles are going to secrete simple protein hormones like growth hormone and prolactin, and you can use the nunomic uh, GPA, growth hormone, G for growth hormone, P for prolactin, A for cytophilic chromophil, uh, to help you remember uh, these properties. And so, basically, the cell secreting growth hormone, the G uh, in this, uh, are cytophilic chromophils called somatotropes. Uh, and the reason for that is the growth hormone is also known as somatotropin. And so growth hormone is associated with regulating growth within the body. And so there are going to be a number of targets within the body that are going to respond to growth hormone. The cells secreting prolactin are going to be known as mammotropes. So again, a second category of acidophilic chromophils. So they secrete either a growth hormone or they secrete prolactin. Prolactin is involved with stimulating breast development as well as stimulating uh, milk production. I skipped a slide. Okay, this, so that was the acidophilic chromophils. The second category of chromophils are going to be the basophilic chromophils. And so again, basophilic because they're going to have a basophilic staining appearance. These cells are going to be larger than the eosinophilic chromophils, fewer and smaller granules, uh, but if we take a look at the granules, uh, they may be PAS positive because they're going to be involved with secreting glycoproteins. The basophilic chromophils will be involved with secreting things like FSH, follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone, uh, ACTH, uh, TSH, uh, so that would be gonadotropes, corticotropes, or thyrotropes. They're also a category of basophilic chromophils within the PARS intermedia, which are going to be melanotropes. They're going to be involved with secreting beta uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone. Uh, you can remember with the mnemonic, the basophilic chromophils with B flat, because it's basophilic chromophils, FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH. So if we take a look at the characteristics uh, of these cells, the gonadotropes are going to secrete either FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which regulates reproductive processes uh, in both the male and female reproductive tract, or luteinizing hormone, LH, which triggers ovulation. The gonadotropes are not going to secrete both. They're going to secrete either FSH or LH. And we're going to talk about the, the functions of SSH and LH when we talk about the reproductive uh, system over the next couple lectures. The corticotropes uh, secrete ACTH, again, so a basophilic chromophil that releases adrenocorticotropin, which is ACTH. It's also known as corticotropin. Uh, this is a hormone released in response to stress, and it regulates the production or release of corticosteroids by the adrenal cortex, which we'll talk about in one of the endocrine system lectures coming up. The thyrotropes secrete TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, it's also referred to as thyrotropin. Uh, it essentially activates the thyroid hormone and stimulates the release of the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. Now, if we take a look at this, we said that the anterior pituitary was not directly innervated by the hypothalamus, but the secretions by the anterior pituitary are regulated uh, by secretions coming from the hypothalamus. And so if we take a look at this, we're going to have a primary capillary plexus uh, up there in nine uh, of the diagram that we're looking at on the right-hand side within the upper infundibular stalk. Uh, that's going to pick up factors that are released by cells from the hypothalamus, so essentially releasing factors. Those are going to diffuse into the blood supply. The blood is going to be transported through the hypophysioportal vein, which is two, and then carried into the anterior pituitary, where within a rich capillary plexus, these releasing factors can get into the anterior pituitary and interact with the cells in this area. So again, this rich fenestrated capillary plexus in uh, the pars distalis within the anterior pituitary in four uh, is going to be able to release both these releasing factors as well as pick up the hormones released by the cells uh, of the anterior pituitary. So if we take a look at the control of the release of the cell, uh, release of the hormones within the anterior pituitary, it's under the control of the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is going to be releasing either releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. These are going to into the primary capillary plexus, flow through the portal veins, and then modulate the release of hormones by the cells within the pituitary. 
And so the cells within the pituitary, either the acidophilic or basophilic chromophiles, are going to release their hormones, in this case uh, FSH or LH on this diagram. Those then are going to interact with their target organ, in this case the testicles. Uh, they're going to release some type of hormone, and that hormone then is going to have a negative feedback on both the cells in the pituitary as well as a negative feedback on the cells within the hypothalamus. And so we have this relatively complex system, but it allows us then to have hypothalamic control of the hormone secretion of the pituitary. The pituitary releases another set of hormones that affect a target cell within a target organ. They produce or do something else, and then there's a feedback mechanism that modulates all of these activities. And that's all I'm going to say about the anterior pituitary at this point. Uh, again, keep in mind the anterior pituitary has an epithelial origin. And if, um, if we take a look at the posterior pituitary, posterior pituitary, we said, has a very pale staining appearance. It looks very, very different from the anterior pituitary. And the reason for that is that the posterior pituitary develops from a downgrowth of neuronal ectoderm from the hypothalamus. So it essentially develops from a downgrowth of the brain. And so it's an extension of the brain. So the neural hypothesis, the portion of the pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary, is neuro in origin. And so we've got a direct innervation from the cells within the hypothalamus. So what we're going to have is cell bodies sitting within either the supraoptic or the paraventricular nuclei within the hypothalamus are going to have their axons, their cell processes, extend all the way down through the infundibulum into the pars nervosa. And it's going to be within the pars nervosa that they're going to release their secretory product. And so if we look in the posterior pituitary, we're not going to see the secretory cells. All we're going to see are the axons. And we're going to see where they're releasing the product. Because the cell bodies are sitting up there in, in 11 and 12 uh, within the hypothalamus itself. So again, within the neural hypothesis, the posterior pituitary, we don't see the neuronal cell bodies because the cell bodies are going to be sitting within the hypothalamus. So what we're going to see are going to be unmyelinated axons. If we remember from our nervous system lecture many weeks ago, um, unmyelinated axons are going to stain relatively poorly. They're going to be very, poor, uh, very pale in appearance. We may see some kind of enlarged regions called herring bodies. These are dilations of the axons where we've basically got the neuro, neurosecretory granules. So these are like the tips of the axons where we've got the secretory product there waiting to be released. And so if we've got the processes from the cells in the paraventricular nucleus, we're going to be releasing oxytocin. The cells from the superoptic nucleus are going to be releasing ADH. And in both cases, the cells are going to be releasing neurofizin, which is a binding protein to help transport either oxytocin or ADH throughout the body. Now, we still see nuclei within the posterior pituitary. And the nuclei at present are going to be pituocytes. Uh, pituocytes are special branch glial cells, which are going to be surrounding and supporting the axons and axon processes uh, associated with the cells within the posterior pituitary. ADH, as we talked about previously in the urinary system lecture, uh, is antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, synthesized by the cells within the supraoptic supra nucleus, but released through the posterior pituitary. Uh, ADH is going to have the effect that it regulates kidney collecting tubule and collecting duct permeability of water so that in the presence of ADH, water is going to be resorbed. So what we're producing is going to be a low volume of highly concentrated urine being produced. Uh, and that's going to finish up what we're going to say about the pituitary gland. Uh, come back in the next lecture series and we're going to take a look at the thyroid and the parathyroid gland. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.